Good afternoon. My name is James Valentine, and welcome to the Adjunct Scientific Meeting on ARVC, a follow-up where we plan to have a discussion to begin to translate the patient voice that we heard at last month's externally-led patient-focused drug development meeting. I'm here in the studio with my co-host, Genevieve Eccles, the Family Support Director of the SADS Foundation, and we again are coming to you live from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, actually not too far from where the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's headquarters are located. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Genevieve to provide some opening remarks and an overview of today's meeting. Genevieve. Thanks, James. Welcome to the SADS Adjunct Scientific Meeting. Today, we'll be discussing more about integrating the patient perspective into therapy development for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or ARVC. My name is Genevieve Eccles, and I'm the Family Support Director for the SATS Foundation. I am honored to be here today to help facilitate this very important discussion. On June 20th, SADS hosted an externally-led patient-focused drug development meeting. During that meeting, those affected with ARVC and their family members shared their experiences with the FDA, clinicians, researchers, industry, and advocacy organizations to help us understand the burden of disease and the need for better treatments. This adjunct scientific meeting today is a critical follow-up to give ARVC clinical and research experts an opportunity to reflect on what was heard during the ELPFDD, as well as identify important subject areas to expand upon. Today, you will hear the results of those reflections. We are grateful for the participants of the SADS ELPFDD for starting this important conversation and providing the patient voice to help inform clinical trial design and therapeutic development. To start the program, Larry Bauer will give a short recap of what we learned from the SADS ARVC ELPFDD. Then, James Valentine will, will provide a general framework for integrating the patient voice in drug development. Following James, we will hear from our expert physician scientist. Dr. Hugh Hawkins will speak to us about opportunities for patient-centered treatment approaches in ARVC. Dr. Sam Sears will follow Dr. Hawkins by providing a landscape analysis of tools to evaluate what's important to ARVC patients. A discussion with talk, top experts will follow, and then Dr. Michael Ackerman will provide us with key takeaways. I'd like to thank our amazing panelists for being a part of this discussion. Drs. Hugh Hawkins, Mario Delmar, Sam Sears, and Wojciech Zariba, and our wonderful genetic counselor, Brittany Murray. I would also like to thank Dr. Michael Ackerman, the president of the SADS Foundation, for being a part of this meeting. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our industry sponsors for their support. Lexio Therapeutics, Pfizer, Rejuvenate Bio, Rocket Pharmaceuticals, and Tenaya Therapeutics for their generous support. To everyone watching online today, thank you. Please submit written questions for your discussion through the form located just below the live stream player. We may have an opportunity during the discussion session to answer your questions, so please Fill out the form below the player, submit, and be a part of today's conversation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Larry Bauer, a regulatory expert and former NIH researcher and former FDA rare disease regulatory scientist, who is going to provide a recap from the June 20th SADS ELPFDD. Larry, take it away. Thank you so much, Genevieve and James. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today for this uh, important meeting. So to begin, uh, an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. I, I'll, I'll do an overview of the agenda for the ELPFDD meeting. Then I'll give an overview of the, the clinical presentation. Then I'll talk about top symptoms and health effects that we heard from patients and caregivers, as well as top unmet medical needs. I'll talk about additional symptoms that were identified during the meeting, as well as the negative feedback loop that people talked about. And I'll close with treatment approaches and people's hopes for the future. 
So the, the meeting, as Genevieve had mentioned, was held on June 20th, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. The meeting was opened by the meeting co-moderator, Genevieve Eccles, from the SADS Foundation. Then we were very fortunate to have a welcome from an FDA uh, staff member, Dr. Chinwe Okoro, who's from the Sieber Office of Therapeutic Products. Uh, after Dr. Okoro's remarks, we had a clinical overview from Dr. Hugh Calkins, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later today. Uh, the meeting then was turned over to the moderator, James Valentine, who's moderating today as well. Uh, we had two main topics that we discussed. The first topic in the morning were the health effects and daily impacts of ARVC. We did this through five pre-recorded panelists um, that, that gave presentations. Then there was a general audience polling, as well as an open discussion with the audience. And we also had five Zoom discussion starters that were people that were participated through Zoom and participated in a live discussion. Uh, we took a break for lunch, and in the afternoon, we were provided with a treatment overview from Dr. Hari Krishna Tandri. Uh, this was followed by the, the topic for the afternoon, which was perspectives on current and future ARVC treatments. Once again, the format was similar to the morning. With We had recorded panelists, polling, audience discussion, and Zoom discussion starters. Uh, at the end of the day, I had a summary of the meeting, and then it was closed with closing remarks from Genevieve Eccles. So Dr. Calkins, in his clinical overview, he stated that uh, ARVC is a genetically determined cardiomyopathy characterized by ventricular arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, and sudden death. It accounts for about 5% of sudden deaths in young individuals. It's characterized by T wave inversions, MRI changes are, and MRI changes are key findings in the diagnosis. Uh, exercise can induce arrhythmias with the average age of onset around 29 years old. Uh, it produces high levels of anxiety from fears of the next episode, which you'll hear about in just a minute. And ARVC is a progressive condition, and 49% of people with the condition develop heart failure. So when our first topic was uh, top symptoms and health effects, one of the, the, the main topics, of course, was sudden death and cardiac arrest. This is often the first symptoms people experience. Uh, we heard from Courtney, who reported that she lost her 17-year-old brother during a football practice to sudden cardiac arrest from undiagnosed ARVC. We also heard from Julia, who at age 31 developed a heart rate of 200 beats per minute and needed to be resuscitated after she went into cardiac arrest. Uh, next, we also heard from Adam, who lost his 31-year-old wife, Jackie, who died from cardiac arrest related to undiagnosed ARVC. They were uh, attending a baseball game. Uh, Jackie went into cardiac arrest. She was administered CPR within 30 seconds, but unfortunately at the baseball field, there was no AED available. Adam's son, Greg, was then subsequently diagnosed with ARVC and had a series of cardiac arrests. And despite having an ICD implanted, Greg had a cardiac arrest at home that was not resolved by his ICD and is now in a permanent vegetative state due to an, an anoxic brain injury. And we also heard from Susan who had a cardiac arrest at age 41 and was saved by a neighbor who was a physician. One of the second symptoms and health effects was arrhythmias, including PVCs, tachycardia. We heard from Jason who reported that at age 38, he had his first symptoms of ARVC, uh, ventricular tachycardia that started during a run and led to ICD and ablation surgery. He can still feel the arrhythmias as they are developing, and it's often triggered by strenuous activity. Uh, we heard from Julia, who states that arrhythmias are one of the things that affect her the most living with ARVC. Regina stated that on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's kind of the return of arrhythmia is one of her biggest concerns or worries. She's been shocked a few times, and just the thought of that every day is still at the forefront of her mind. Andrea shared, while my child has no evidence of disease yet, we live in a state of anxiety that one day symptoms will appear. 
We've been advised to limit our child's involvement in sports and notify schools, camp, and caregivers of the risk of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death to ensure that CPR and the use of uh, AEDs is, is the go-to for any emergencies. And then we heard from Jeff, who went into ventricular tachycardia and ended up in the ER and needed cardioversion within hours. In 2021, Jeff said he got shocked five times within a minute. Another top symptom was heart failure and disease progression. Heather shared, when I was diagnosed, I was 20 years old and I was told by my electrophysiologist, you are on the cutting edge of mortality, which means there weren't many people that were much older than me that had lived. Christy shared that her aunt died of heart failure at age 60. She stayed six months after the ablation, her own. My heart function is not improved. I did not even know reduced ejection fraction was a risk of that procedure. I am now on three of the four classes of heart failure medicines and a lower dose of flecainide. Ryan shared shocks, pills, ablations, heart failure, and heart transplants are the things that he worries about. I think about these issues at night and from the moment I wake up. Regina shared that progression to heart failure is always on her mind. When she experiences stress at work and in her life, she worries it's going to push her into heart failure. And advancing to heart failure was a very key worry identified in audience polling. Another top health effect was fatigue and low energy. We heard from Nelson, who's currently 51, and shared, I fatigue very easily just from kneeling down or standing up. Doing the littlest things like walking exhausts me. At time, for no reason or just standing will trigger PVCs, a weakness that fills my entire body, and I have to immediately lay on the sofa for days. I cannot even pick up my guitar and play for more than five minutes as my weakness and anxiety kicks in. Courtney experiences fatigue as a side effect of flecainide. Julia shared fatigue leads to weight gain, depression, social anxiety, and affects all aspects of her life. She's had a lot of therapy and hopes one day she can run again. She has had a heart rate over 200 and collapsed once with a cardiac arrest. She worries that as she gets older, she won't be able to keep up. And then one of the, the other top symptoms that we heard that was we heard again and again throughout the day was the issues related to anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. Courtney shared, I was so accustomed to the feeling of PVCs, my heart jumping in my chest and an immediate sense of anxiety during things like important work meetings, while sitting in traffic during rush hour or even as I was vacuuming the house. And anxiety is no friend of this disease. Yet, one of the major treatments is my defibrillator, one of the most anxiety-inducing aspects of my life. Julia shared, I have anxiety from the harsher arrhythmias and PVC storms. I've been managing my symptoms with a combination of going slower, taking care of myself, and plenty of therapy. I find places to go when I'm struggling and work on my breathing. Some of my fears are going into cardiac arrest when no one is around or triggering an ICD shock from overexertion. Adam shared within our family, there are varying thoughts, images, grief, PTSD, and other realities associated with the condition. And we all have our own individual needs in terms of how we deal with it. Some go to bed afraid they won't wake up in the morning. And finally, Alice shared, I never imagined myself at 30 with intense PTSD, taking heart failure medication and antiarrhythmic medication, but I was happy to turn 30. So one of the things related to anxiety and PTSD is that we heard that there's a negative feedback loop. So people experience arrhythmias, they go into you know, ventricular tachycardia, then they get a cardiac shock. Well, the cardiac shock and worrying about whether they're going to get another one, that then causes greater anxiety. People start to worry and, you know, am I going to have another one? And then as their anxiety increases, anxiety triggers arrhythmias. So there's this, this feedback, negative feedback loop that it's, you know, people are struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one person said the arrhythmias often go hand in hand with anxiety surrounding our condition. One tends to precipitate the other. So it's hard to know which comes first. 
you're having lots of palpitations and arrhythmias that can stir some anxiety for whatever reason, whether that's ICD shocks, et cetera, and then being worked up and having that adrenaline really then precipitates more arrhythmias. When we did the audience, the general audience polling about what are the most burdensome uh, symptoms of living with uh, ARVC, the top three in the percent of responses that we, you know, came back to us were arrhythmias and palpitations was number one, fatigue was the second most uh, highly rated uh, burden, and then the third one was anxiety or depression with uh, exercise intolerance came in closely after that. Um, additional issues identified uh, as, as possible symptoms and life impacts are the need for repeat procedures. For instance, many people said that cardiac ablation surgery was not successful after the first surgery, and they've had to go back more than once, some people several times, to uh, try to get the correct nerves um, ablated. Other people have talked about the medications losing efficacy over time, so they lose the value and the effects of those treatments. And then many of the medications that, that people are taking have side effects. As far as treatment approaches, one of the main ones is uh, antiarrhythmics. Courtney shared, and how nearly a decade later, I can still say that it's a lot to handle. I start every morning with a dose of heart medication and end every night with two more doses. Um, her medications cause fatigue and dizziness, one impacts vision, and she has to be conscious about blood draws to gauge potential impacts on her kidneys and livers. liver. Tracy shared, today I no longer read books because of brain fog from the medications, and she has heart fa uh, failure, which makes it difficult to focus. Susan shared, so I got on medication then for arrhythmias, and I was pretty good for about a year and a half, and I assumed that if I didn't do any exercise, I was in the clear, and I could control the arrhythmias until I was getting my hair cut one day, and out of the blue in the chair, everything went dark. Other treatment approaches include ICDs, which are highly effective but can lead to anxiety and PTSD, as we discussed earlier, ablation surgery. Um, Jason shared, once the initial ablation and ICD surgeries were completed, that's when I had to hit the reset, but that's when the struggle really started to find the new me and the new normal. And as I said, it often has to be repeated. Heart transplant is also a, a treatment. It's effective, but requires continued treatment and monitoring. monitoring. Ryan says, shocks, pills, ablations, heart failure, transplant are things I worry about. Other treatment approaches, approaches include symptomatic medications, such as for anti-anxiety, therapy and counseling, exercise moderation, and diet modification. Downsides of treatments are the shocks from ICDs. Um, Jason said, my body was stuck in, in ventricular tachycardia and I received three shocks within about 10 minutes. Um, Courtney shared, and within two months, I received my first subcutaneous defibrillator, a surgery that gave her three incisions. Um, Adam shared, Greg felt his ICD activate after the 911 um, that he called, but then he passed out on the phone. And despite his being shocked 30 times, his muscles did, did not respond. There's also issues related to heart transplant. Um, the average, it's one person, Susan said, someone lives with a heart transplant is 10 years and she's four years in and doesn't like to think of it that way. Um, Joel, uh, Joel shared, while I may no longer have ARVC and I'm physically much better, I participate in sports again, but she's just balancing um, another type of lifestyle after transplant. Finally, in our polling for hopes for future treatments, the top three were advanced heart failure, this is, this is what they'd like to see a treatment for, advanced heart failure, arrhythmias, palpitation, and risk of sudden cardiac arrest. Jason shared anything that can improve heart function, I think. Um, there are other treatments that can improve some of the heart function so that we can regain some of our abilities that he's looking for. So thank you very much. And I now turn it back to the studio.
Thank you, Larry. James Valentine has spent the last 15 years helping to incorporate the patient voice into drug development and regulatory decision making, including his time at the FDA. He will provide a general framework for integrating the patient voice in drug development. Thank you so much, Genevieve, and it's uh, great to be here uh, speaking with you all today. Um, you know, we just heard such a great summary and, and uh, really, you know, if you haven't had the chance, I encourage you to go back and watch the recording of the full externally led patient focused drug development meeting. Uh, we could only, you know, give voice to a few of the many quotes and experiences that were shared throughout that day. But now that we understand a little bit about uh, what uh, the individuals living with ARVC and their direct caregivers, um, you know, what they report as the most burdensome, what their top treatment goals are. Um, we want to shift things a little bit and, and start to translate, you know, that information to help inform drug development and clinical trials. So I'm going to give a little bit uh, of an overview uh, about this uh, to set a, fr a framework for our expert uh, clinician and researcher discussion that will follow. So patient-focused drug development, um, the initiative that was launched by FDA was launched back in 2012. Um, this initiative, while focused around these patient-focused drug development meetings that both FDA as well as external stakeholders host, really is more than just these meetings. It's really a philosophy about how to go about drug development. And so when FDA launched the PFDD initiative uh, in its announcement, it recognized that patients who live with the disease have a direct stake in the outcome of FDA's decisions and are in a unique position to contribute to the understanding of their disease. And so with that as a really core pillar of the philosophy of patient-focused drug development, I'm gonna take us through a few more specific ways that the patient voice can help inform drug development and review. I'm gonna start with the end, which is the FDA approval decision. This is at a point where clinical trials have been completed and we have information about a drug's benefits and risks. And at that moment, when considering to whether to approve a new drug, FDA has to make a determination of whether the benefits of the drug outweigh the known and expected risks of that drug. FDA uses its scientific expertise to help determine and evaluate what those benefits are and what the risks are by uh, their analysis and review of the data. And they also have to make judgment calls about how much certainty about those benefits and risks. But even though there is that scientific uh, evaluation, there's also an inherently subjective value judgment that then overlays that. And so when deciding whether then those known uh, benefits and those known risks and, and, and expected risks um, are determined, FDA has to, again, make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. And so, you know, it, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach and will vary significantly best based off of the condition that's being considered. And so the question is then, where does FDA actually get the information to help calibrate how much risk a patient population would tolerate for a given set of benefits? And the answer is, of course, from you know, the, the patient and caregiver stakeholders themselves. And I also want to mention that when we talk about risk, most commonly we talk about in terms of safety risks, but there is also a risk that relates to the amount of uncertainty about treatment benefit that exists for a product. Particularly in rare disease settings like this, uh, clinical trial data is going to inherently have degrees of uncertainty um, how confident are we that the treatment effect seen is real? And so uh, there's different amounts of risks that patients may be willing to take in terms of how certain they would need those treatment benefits to be uh, in order to consider whether taking a new product. And so the way operationally that FDA then considers the patient voice to help inform those benefit risk decisions is to hear directly from patient voices and their direct caregivers and to really dig into two particular categories of the patient experience. First, their burdens of, with the disease and impacts on patients' daily lives. And second, with regard to patients' perspectives on the adequacy of available therapies to help understand what their unmet medical needs are. And so you might 
notice and recognize that those two categories directly relate to the two topics that we addressed in last month's externally led patient focused drug development meeting, and that was very intentional. These two categories of information then help FDA understand what types of benefits will matter most to patients. And the way that they, you know, put this together and consider this is within a structured benefit risk decision making framework. Whenever FDA is do, uh, uh, reviewing a new product for potential approval, you know, they first, as part of their decision making, outline their analysis of the condition. Again, what are those most, uh, you know, what is, are the greatest burdens and troubles of a condition as expressed by patients? And similarly, what are the unmet medical needs? What have patients expressed in terms of gaps that, uh, and, and things that they would like to see on top of available therapies? And so those two rows in this uh, structured benefit risk framework then set the context for how FDA will analyze the benefits that they're going to describe, the risks and risk management or mitigation techniques. So that way, in that final row on the table, they can make that value judgment of whether the benefits do, in fact, outweigh the risks. But the patient voice isn't only valuable at the end of drug development when making benefit risk decisions. Uh, if we take a step back and think about the you know, uh, design of clinical trials, um, so very important you know, uh, to make sure that we have uh, results in clinical trial information that can tell us whether or not a product is addressing the things that are important to patients. And one of the primary ways of doing this is through selecting clinical outcome assessments that, which are tools that help measure how patients feel or function. And clinical outcome assessments, you know, these are tools that can be either measures of performance, they can be clinician reported, observer, like a caregiver reported, and even patient reported. Um, when we talk about this, there's other kinds of endpoints. Um, you know, we might have survival endpoints or even surrogate biomarker endpoints. But for the scope of what I'm talking about today, we're talking about those outcome assessments that do directly measure the, how a patient is feeling and functioning in daily life. And these are important because these endpoints can be used in adequate and well-controlled studies to support FDA approvals. And so as we're thinking about where, how can the ARVC patient and caregiver voice help us um, pick the right clinical outcome assessments, well, here's a few key questions that information uh, from the PFDD meeting can help us answer. We can think about how do we know that we're measuring the right things, the right concepts. Once we know what those right concepts are to measure, what opportunities there are there to measure those concepts in patients' daily lives? For example, if we hear that there's a lot of day-to-day -day variability in a particular symptom or health effect, it may not make sense to only measure it once every six months or every 12 months. Um, because we don't know if we're going to be getting a patient on a good day or a bad day, and maybe we need to find a way to measure it on a daily basis. Um, so these are some of the things that we heard at the PFDD meeting is, you know, outside of clinic visits, how do patients experience these different symptoms and health effects? And then finally, if we're thinking about actually interpreting the results of any of these clinical outcome assessments, we want to know, you know, what would actually be considered clinically meaningful in terms of the degree of change that might be seen on any outcome measure. One final area that I'd like to uh, raise in terms of the ways that patient voice can help inform uh, drug development and review uh, relates to other aspects of clinical trial designs, not just the endpoints, but you know, what's the scope, size, you know, and, and otherwise clinical trial design um, you know, that can be used to help establish a drug safety and effectiveness. And so the way that uh, FDA views this is, is uh, based in the, the legal regulatory framework, they have to find that there's substantial evidence of a drug's benefit. And so this is informed not only by the, uh, this is informed not only by robustness of results, but also in terms of assessing how reliable the trial design is and other statistical considerations that help us determine whether results are due to chance. So this substantial evidence finding must be based on at least one adequate and well-controlled clinical trial. And while typically FDA views randomized, double-blind, concurrently controlled trials as providing the greatest certainty, the regulatory framework is also designed and FDA recognizes that in different disease settings, 
different trial designs may be appropriate. And in particular, they, you know, the, the regulatory framework um, wants this kind of flexibility to be applied when a disease is serious, when there's an unmet medical need, or when a disease is rare. And ARVC checks all three of those boxes. So this recognizes that in this type of setting, you know, like ARVC, there's uh, a somewhat greater risk of false positive conclusions. And that goes back to what I mentioned earlier. There can be a, maybe less certainty about a drug's effectiveness that could help support a conclusion of substantial evidence. And so just to maybe you know, make this a little bit more concrete, I'll give a few examples that actually come from FDA's own guidance on trial designs. Maybe we would accept uh, evidence from a single arm trial with an ex external control, like a natural history control group. Uh, maybe we would uh, approve based off of an un unvalidated but reasonably likely surrogate biomarker or intermediate clinical endpoint, which could support an accelerated approval. Or perhaps we would be able to pre-specify a p-value of greater than 0.05 when justified to allow and accommodate um, some powering uh, concerns that may exist, particularly in rare disease settings. So keeping all of this in mind um, and, and knowing that I can only cover so much in today's presentation, I do want to alert you to some resources that uh, dive into these topics in greater detail. FDA has a whole uh, a multiple part series of, on patient focused uh, drug development that provides guidance um, on different methods and ways to apply um, input from patients. Uh, and FDA also has a draft guidance on substantial evidence of effectiveness, which goes into a lot of those uh, aspects of uh, approaches to designing clinical development programs that can meet FDA standards and where appropriate flexibility can be applied. So with that, I think, um, you know, uh, I think we hopefully have set a little bit of a foundation of how the patient voice can really inform drug development and drug review. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing our uh, ARVC, you know, scientific and research experts kind of think through some of these issues and, and think about how the patient voice applies uh, in this condition. Yes. Thank you, James. We are excited to hear next from Dr. Hugh Calkins. He's the director of the ARVC slash D program at Johns Hopkins University. He will speak to us about opportunities for patient-centered treatment approaches in ARVC. Over to you, Dr. Calkins. Great, thank you. Give me one minute for the helicopter to fly by. It's making a bit of a racket, so give me one second to get this person wherever they need to go on the helicopter. Okay, they're gone. So I, uh, well, for, first, I'm very glad to be a part of this. I appreciate the invitation and, and appreciate all my colleagues that are on the panel and giving presentations. As I heard those, that summary of the patient meeting, which unfortunately I missed, but I did read the transcript. You know, it reminds me of what I hear every day that ARVC is a terrible disease. I mean, it's terrible because of the arrhythmias, the risk of sudden death. I mean, we've heard all the reasons you know, the risk of heart failure and to see what it does to patients and to hear those stories, you know, is one of the reasons our program's been in business for 25 years and we're not giving up till we get this disease cured. And it's really in that context that I'm so excited about this new era, era of gene therapy, the hope of, uh, you know, a, a dramatic treatment strategy, which 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 overcomes many of the limitations we've heard about current treatments. You can use antiarrhythmic drugs, but they have side effects that don't always work. You can do catheter ablation, but oftentimes you have to do one, two, three, or more. You can put defibrillators in, but they give shocks and cause tremendous stress and PTSD. And, and the stress caused by a shock can trigger more arrhythmias. So it's certainly imperfect, but it's a, a life-saving treatment. You can do a transplant, but as you pointed out in the in the discussion, the survival is only 10 years after getting a transplant, and it's very hard to find, uh, you, know, you know, the shortage of donors is, is enormous. So it, I think we all can agree that ARVC is a terrible condition, and I'm glad the world is focused on new and better ways to treat this condition. And obviously, when we 
think about study design, it's tricky for all the reasons that have been brought up. It's a rare disease. People are at different stages in the disease. Uh, when you're designing a clinical trial, what's the endpoint going to be? Is it going to be randomized or non-randomized? And how do you factor in quality of life? And I know Sam Sears is going to be speaking, and there's no one better to give that part of the presentation to talk about quality of life, anxiety, how ARVC impacts quality of life measures. And clearly, any clinical trial in ARVC will need to look at quality of life as one of the endpoints. And I think when you think about what we've heard about quality of life and anxiety, it sort of reflects first the arrhythmias, the PVCs, the VT, the deferrofear, the defibrillator shock. So if novel therapeutics like gene therapy had a profound and dramatic effect on reducing arrhythmia burden with certainty, uh, you know, that would go a long way in making a big impact in this disease. I think is what Sam has taught me and what I've seen in my own practice is once you get a shock or two or three shocks or 10 shocks, you have PTSD and it takes months to years for that anxiety to sort of fade and to sort of feel confident again in one's life. And so if, if gene therapy would shut down the arrhythmias, eliminate that risk, you know, it would reverse the entire cycle that causes the anxiety impacts quality of life. From, from some of the early data I've seen from some of the, the mouse models of gene therapy, one of the more profound effects of gene therapy is a dramatic reduction in PVCs, also a dramatic reduction in heart failure. So I'm extremely optimistic, but I'm also uh, realistic that a gene therapy treatment is a daunting exercise. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I th I'm very excited about the era of therapeutics we're in with ARVC. I'm very excited about gene therapy. I, I'm glad that sessions like this exist where we're discussing it, trying to come up with the best trial design, the right endpoints. I'm going to be interested to see what Sam says. Uh, and I think I'll stop there and just turn it over to uh, the next speaker. But again, I'm pleased to be a part of the uh, group today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calkins, for your remarks. Dr. Sam Sears with the Department of Psychology and Cardiovascular Sciences at East Carolina University will be providing a landscape analysis of tools to evaluate what's important to ARVC patients. Take it away, Dr. Sears. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here as well today and be a part of this group solving this important set of issues. Patients and families can be encouraged about the progress made with research related to ARVC. But as we know, next slide, there we go. But as we know, basically the idea of trying to meet all of the needs of ARVC families and, and patients to address the psychologic, social, behavioral, daily issues, lifestyle, limitations that go with this disease means that our patients have to rely on safety nets like genetic testing, like ICDs, like medications to, to minimize the threat that this disease pre presents. In my time with you today, I just wanna highlight where I think the five major themes are in terms of both research and clinical practice in the, in the care of ARVC patients. First, I'm gonna suggest that ARVC patients are at risk for psychological distress in many ways because of the condition. ARVC is a medical mental burden that this is more than just simply desmoplakin problems. This is a syndromal disease state that has far reaching effects. The ambiguity in particular is, is in high stakes situations, regardless of the, of the context is highly stressful for individuals and ambiguity has a place here in ARVC. ARVC is a family condition, a whole family disease. Uh, and the idea that how genetic testing can help us identify risk and maybe reassure, maybe not, um, becomes part of that. And then finally, the quality of life and, and patient reported outcomes are understudied. And I'll address how we try to get at some of these key outcomes. Next slide, I think. 
So I'll start with the idea, but why are ARVC patients at risk? Because ambiguity, the uncertain security of your health and your well-being creates significant day-to-day -day stress. We saw it in the quotes. We hear it from our patients. The ambiguity is real. Restricting people's activities, of course, creates a different level of stress and change and, and other than-ness, that is feeling other than other people, different than other people. We learned about ICD-related stress, which is, of course, the idea of ICD shocks, both the presence of arrhythmias as well as the presence of shocks. And then finally, future outlook stress. Young people dealing with heart disease are age inappropriate. They're dealing with issues about what will their future look like from an occupational, from a uh, family planning, from uh, every perspective. The future is an, a critical change element here. And we know that what people believe about the future is a significant predictor of their present mental health. Next slide, please. Yeah. You know, we heard a lot about the anxiety. We heard a lot about how anxiety was prominent in our in, in our ARVC patients. The rates, uh, when you look at channelopathies and you look at, at the a range of these sort of similar disorders, they all come in around 33 to 38% of patients being anxious. So that's one in three. So of course, that's gonna be a prominent, frequent uh, issue. Depression, a little bit higher than normal. We expect rates of depression in the in the sort of nine to 12% range, averaging about 11. So a little bit more depression in this group than we might expect based on uh, normative samples. But anxiety is clearly the marker here that gets uh, the most uh, problem associated with it. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we saw that this is not simply a, a medical problem, that the mental burden of living with this disease persists. That of course, stress is normal and expected, but in our patients with ARVC, they have to deal with both the general aspects of living with life, but then also specific aspects of managing this disease changing their daily activity behaviors, managing the disease, the device, and it's challenging. That medical mental burden then almost means that we all have to have a growth mindset, meaning that we have to think about how do we get, how do we become receptive to change? How do we become as flexible as possible while also trying to play a long game, trying to live long? So these are challenges. This medical mental burden is real. Next slide. And in this slide, you see the role that we've written about in terms of how uncertainty, whether it be uh, from uh, genetic testing that are uncertain, having carrier status, et cetera, having uncertainty and how it leads to behavioral outcomes like um, worrying about uh, your physical activity, worrying about your heart, listening to your body, trying to constantly catch yourself. Was that a PVC? Was that something that's dangerous? Is danger around the corner? And that hypervigilance and sort of tuning into somatic symptoms or body symptoms becomes how this distress shows up. It's not just simply worry. It's not just simply this. In fact, it's not some sort of neuroticism. It is a adaptive response to an unknown or ambiguous threat. Next slide. So ambiguity in all situations, humans don't like ambiguity. They don't like when they're uncertain about what's going to happen. Some people say, well, that you mean they don't they they want control. Well, control is part of it, but it's anytime there's a situation where people have to make a decision with high stakes on the line, it's known to be stressful. Probably why we watch shows like Survivor or game shows when people have to make decisions under pressure. But when you look at why people get distressed from ambiguous situations in disease, it goes along these ideas of what is it that I have? How do you know that's what I have? I don't feel sick. Dr. Ackerman's talked about what's called genetic purgatory, where, where we're just not sure uh, exactly how this will manifest. And what's the impact? What am I supposed to do now? You gave me this diagnosis, now what? What am I allowed to do? Now you're gonna tell me what I'm allowed to do? These are known to be difficult conversations and really maybe, I, maybe I'll be fine if you just leave me alone. And those sort of, fantasy hopes um, can persist at times. Next slide. We have some data about genetic testing. In this case, they were looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
But what's interesting about this study is that it did show that that um, the reason for testing was to reduce ambiguity, to try to reduce doubt. The, the majority of people who were willing to go undergo these kinds of tests in hypertrophic patients wanted to know in order to reduce uh, the unknowns. And the good news is that testing, while there was some unfavorable impact, no patients regretted it. That genetic testing persists as a valuable tool to try to reduce ambiguity, even if it creates some, some uh, uh, discomfort in the short run. Next slide. And because ARVC is a family disease, of course, all of these expected kinds of um, psychological consequences, feeling guilty about having passed along these genes, worrying about how some of the things their hopes and dreams are might be different, or they may have lost the ability to, for example, become a marathon runner. Fears about the future, as I mentioned earlier, accommodating reduced activity, and certainly the unknowns related to devices. Um, all the way from uh, the function of a device, as there was an ICD recall recently, all the way through to, will it work when I need it? Is the safety net strong when I need it? Next slide. And in fact, the relationship of this family disease, when you look at um, some data we showed in a group of pediatric um, cardiology patients at Stanford, where we looked at kids and parents, where in fact, parents did take the brunt of the psychological uh, distress here that PTSD and oh, almost half of all patients um, seen in pediatric clinic, uh, pediatric cardiology clinic there with arrhythmias, uh, these patients and their parents were in quite distress. And good news is PTSD was quite a bit uh, lower for the, for the kids, but it just shows that this whole family is affected in various ways by this disease state. Next slide. And we've written extensively about the role of the ICD in both anxiety. The, the mixed message here is that when you look at the top three rows, you see traditional psychiatric syndromes, all ranging somewhere between 13 and 40%, which kind of averages again at about a third, about a third of our patients with ICDs. Now, this involves all, all ages across many, many studies, so there's a range. But basically, we look at about a third of our patients dealing with some level of clinically significant psychological stress. But I would note that actually the vast, the, the sort of bigger issue has to do with the lower three rows that are specific concerns that go along with the defibrillator. The defibrillator is a fantastic invention of our time, but it has its own nuances, including shock anxiety, worrying about being shocked or recovering from shock, as Dr. Hopkins mentioned, avoidance of activity, being afraid of doing, quote, anything, uh, not just the limitations associated with our ERVC. And then, um, you know, helping people understand how does this device work? What am I allowed to do? Uh, becomes actually a constant level of patient education that's necessary. Next slide. So when we start to move now toward what is the quality of life and, and patient-reported outcomes, they're understudied. In cardiology, we've, we've, we're, we continue to try to integrate more and more patient-reported outcomes. And everybody agrees that, of course, you know, reducing death and physical harm is job one. But as soon as we do that, we start getting into what, what's it like to have this disease and how do we measure the persistent stresses, the persistent mental uh, burden that goes with these diseases. How do we understand the intrusiveness of these diseases? And it becomes here where we start chasing a lot of different endpoints. And I want to look at that in my final time with you. Next slide. So fundamentally, our patients must deal with the idea, do you attend to the safety net and say, yes, I have this condition, but I have a safety net. Here's the things I'm doing that are protecting my heart and my health and, uh, and move one's attention to that versus feeling like you could just scream that if one spends time considering the threats, it's hard to feel calm much at all because the threat is persistent, but so is the security net. And those two persistent forces are real. Next slide. It's here that I think we have a very interesting study from the last year. In this study of 
1,800 ICD patients in Europe. They asked ICD patients, what's your number one concern? And you can see that 80% said, I worry about being shot. And it was, a, it was a very clear number one concern. But then look at the other side of it. What's the number one benefit of an ICD? And they said, I feel safer with an ICD. That that paradox, that almost inconsistent relationship between feeling safe and threatened at the same time is a very unique circumstance for patients with defibrillators. I think this is one of the most important contrasting kinds of pieces of data that we've had in quite some time. We've known this, but to see it in such a black and white, seemingly conflictual point is exactly what I think it's like uh, for many of our patients with defibrillators. Next slide. And when you look specifically at the fears and concerns that um, ICD patients have reported, this meta-analysis that came out um, last year, you can see fear and insecurity remain as the number one concern of ICD patients. Need for information, even in the patients who have known non-genetically uh, uh, tied conditions, Need for information still was a the second most important high priority across all of these studies. And you can see the others, impacts on life, living with shocks, gender differences, and role on family. All of these things we've talked about even in my 10 minutes with you. Next slide. So it's a target-rich environment. How can we tie down? What are all the targets that can more properly reflect the patient experience? Next slide. So the World Health Organization defined health in 1947 as going beyond uh, simply not dying and focusing on a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not, near, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I might even put a little asterisk here that said, even if we have the perfect treatment for ARVC, trusting that treatment and recovering one's confidence to engage in a full array of behaviors will still be needing attention. That there won't necessarily be a magic wand here, but rather trusting, trusting the, a life beyond a treatment will be important. Next slide. So I'd like to label this section going beyond quality of life. I consider quality of life as basically just a, a couple of three words we use to describe the patient experience. That in cardiology, we've sort of driven toward the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire as the answer to all answers. And I think we have to go beyond that. I do think that measure has a place. But I think we have to think more about what are the factors that help people adapt or are factors associated with having more troubles. We have to go beyond simply just, well, um, what's bad that's happening? Well, what's good that's happening? How are we finding silver linings as well as the decrements and we have to measure both the symptoms of health as well as the symptoms of disease. Now that gets tricky. Our healthcare system's focused on disease and disability and impairment. It's not focused on feeling, feeling uh, having sense of gratitude or feeling awe or recognizing the value in, of, of a moment. We don't necessarily have those. And maybe that's too artistic. Maybe it's too poetic. But I would argue it's part of the patient experience. Next slide. We have the model called the biopsychosocial model, which probably gives us the best simple idea. It doesn't look so simple on this slide, but, the, but basically one's response to a disease goes beyond the biologic outcomes or the pathophysiology, moves to, towards one's mental and emotional functioning. And then finally, also looking at one's social context, the ability to function in family, function in their community, function at work, function, in various ways. But the biopsychosocial model and looking at some of the endpoints that would be reflected here is a reasonable step forward in terms of quality of life metrics. Next slide. In cancer, they've done things more that have been focused on things like mobility, uh, things like symptoms and everyday tasks. I think that's another paradigm that makes sense. This just happens to be a cancer one that we go beyond simply, well, um, how do you feel um, in terms of overall health? certainly recognizing anxiety and stress, recognizing mobility, recognizing everyday tasks. Can you do the things you wanna do? This gets closer to um, a more com comprehensive view of the patient experience. Next slide. 
Now, when I think about research around quality of life and patient reported outcomes, I have sat on many, 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 many research studies uh, boards in which we have a million dollar study and they say, and quality of life's really important. Hey, um, we're gonna give you 10 questions. Go ahead and measure quality of life for us. That the quick and dirty approach to understanding patients is understandable on the one hand, but not so understandable if that becomes as important <clears throat> in a long-term solution as I think it is. That is, not everything can be measured quick and dirty. There may be opportunities that are that are more serial in nature that a series of, of samplings are necessary. That there's really no single right answer. There's no such thing as the definitive measure of quality of life, that it may be idiosyncratic to, to the specific disease. Also, I think regulatory and patient have different priorities. You know, we, we learned about that earlier about regulatory priorities. And I think often the burden of a disease, in my view, has a place that, that deserves uh, a very close 1A, 1B type priority and uh, helping to understand both objective and subjective indices. I think is the actual truth lies somewhere within that objective and subjective um, set of metrics. Next slide. And so you can see, this is just another example of how, when you think about the patient experience, it's understanding beliefs about the disease and about the future. It's understanding quality of life. It's understanding psychologic function. It's understanding what, it, what do I have to do every day to take care of myself? And then what are the things I'm able to do or I'm limited from doing that we get closer to a patient experience that's measurable and comprehensive. Next slide. And I sometimes refer to it as the peace of mind metric, the back to normal metric, and the quality of life metric. It doesn't necessarily uh, have any single right answer, but we have metrics like cardiac anxiety questionnaire as opposed to generic anxiety. We have things like um, activity avoidance measures and things like uh, shock anxiety that are specific to patients with defibrillators. Next slide. And I think there's room here for creativity. There's room to look at more specific fears within a disease, like fears of exertion. So even if you're told to limit exercise, what happens when you uh, need to do some exercise to complete a daily activity? You know, what about fear of recurrence? How does fear of recurrence every day create a burden? And what are things we can do to reduce that burden and to address that and measure that? And how do beliefs about how long you're going to live affect? We, re we heard about the heart transplant patient who said, well, 10 years, I've already got four. You know, how does longevity, how does the belief about how long you are going to live, how does that manifest itself? How does it show up in our patients' activities and our patients' beliefs? Days spent in healthcare, I love this, you know, the LVAD data that shows that 24% of every LVAD day after an LVAD is spent getting healthcare. That means... One out of every one day out of every work week, LVAD patients are getting care. I think that's important. You know, how do what are the burdens of self-care? How do we how do we help our patients gather control? How does how does worse symptom? You know, I saw that data that they showed earlier about the worst symptom of ARVC. You know, maybe that maybe we target that for um, as an outcome. Did we address what was bothering you the most? I think those are reasonable, certainly in the heart failure space, that's been able to uh, show some value. Next slide. So at the end of the day here, you know, I think the major themes are, yes, ARVC patients are at risk, and we need to provide some degree of attentiveness to that, whether that be screening or integrated care, that we've got to do more to recognize the mental medical burden, that we've got to validate that this is ambiguous, and some of this stuff is tough to deal with. Um, nobody's built with a uh, an easy way of managing high stakes ambiguity. That that requires bringing bringing support to folks managing that. We certainly recognize the family disease component, and that and that as we look at quality of life impacts and patient reported outcomes, we've got to study that more. We've got to be willing to invest time, money, and effort in the patient experience metrics in order to understand and uh, for that to cultivate. Uh, better research designs. Next slide. So we go from this sort of semi-transparent view, uh, next slide, 
of families dealing with this to a clearer view when we involve the patient experience in measuring. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sears, for uh, giving us that wonderful, really, you know, uh, more wholesome uh, explanation of, of, you know, patients, not only disease, but health in ARVC, you know, and, and uh, taking, you know, a first step for us today, you know, at, at offering some ideas and insights into where we might be able to, you know, uh, capture things that are important to patients in clinical trials. Uh, you know, we, we're hoping for today is to have a, a discussion, you know, to, to really help translate the ARVC patient voice. We've, we've heard that now from both Dr. Calkins and Dr. Sears. Um, but now we get to actually move into the discussion um, of, of various key topics related to drug development and review with a whole panel of experts. And so in addition to the two experts you just heard from, we are also joined by Brittany Murray, a genetic counselor with the Johns Hopkins ARVD slash C program. We have Dr. Wojciech uh, Zriba from, with the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center at the University of Rochester Medical Center. We have Dr. Mario Delmar, a professor of cardiology at NYU Langone. And so uh, I'd like to welcome our, our panel of experts to this discussion. Before we jump into things, I do wanna remind our live audience um, you know, this is uh, an interactive discussion, and if you have questions that uh, you would like to raise for our, uh, as part of our expert discussion, there is that live comment box under the live stream here today. You can submit your uh, questions in there. Uh, Genevieve and I will be looking for those and, and working uh, those into the discussion um, throughout uh, today's session. So to get us started, um, you know, I, I wanted to start maybe uh, um, Dr. Zriba, you could, could start us on this, you know, thinking about, you know, what was heard from patients and caregivers at the externally patient-focused drug development meeting, you know, uh, I think we've, we've heard a couple things that maybe really stood out, maybe surprising, maybe not so pr surprising, but noteworthy. Um, you know, what, what stood out to you from what, what you heard out of that externally PFDD meeting um, that, that is probably worth, you know, pointing out for our audience today? I think that one of the most important aspects of discussion is what eventually patient is expecting uh, to get from the novel therapy. So <clears throat> we heard stories of patients affected by disease. We heard <clears throat> that some existing medication might help. <clears throat> Somebody mentioned flaconite, for example, that arrhythmias were reduce in response to flaconide. And obviously this brings us to endpoints, which was already touched on. These endpoints may vary from a number of arrhythmic uh, events, a number of uh, arrhythmias on halter or some longer recording. And this will be number of ventricular premature beats or non-sustained VTs, but those additional, those uh, endpoints may not be fully translated into a reduction in mortality and reduction in heart failure. So we have to really think along the line of uh, larger studies, which will allow us to collect data on those harder endpoints, not only endpoints related to arrhythmia, which might be transient, and control to some extent. We're all excited about a possibility of new gene therapies. And those gene therapies is probably what every patient with inherited arrhythmia disease, whether it's ARVC, long QT, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT or Brugada, everybody is really counting that one day we'll have effective gene therapy. And those concerns which are raised by patient in the forum today, uh, summarized today and prior forum uh, could be alleviated in advance of symptoms uh, early on. Uh, obviously these early stage trials like uh, those which are planned by a few companies uh, eager to um, step in with gene therapy will probably include some patient with already 
existing symptoms. Some patients who are at higher risk, at the same time, patients who, ha who are protected by an ICD. Why? Because obviously we don't know how people will react to the gene therapy. As much as Dr. Hugh Colkins uh, indicated, we are excited about uh, mice data and very encouraging animal data for gene therapy, we have to still be cautious and evaluate it. So this is why those companies, to our knowledge, are planning to go very uh, cautiously, slowly with, first of all, implementing this therapy one patient by one, almost, sure. and subsequently, once it, show, it shows some safety, uh, they will be eventually pushed to evaluate the efficacy, efficacy for the short term and measure most likely by arrhythmias and subsequently long term, which might be measured by eventually uh, function of right ventricle or left ventricle. So um, this would be my initial comment on uh, this wonderful summary. Sure. And well, thank you so much for those thoughtful comments. There's a lot to unpack in what you said, and I think we'll um, definitely be circling back to a number of those topics. Um, before we do that, I want to also ask you, um, you know, uh, Brittany, if you uh, want to kick off with any, you know, uh, top line reactions that you had after hearing the patient voice, you know, that that was elicited last month, um, you know, what what maybe stood out to you and um, I know you bring a very unique role as a, a genetic counselor that serves this patient community. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to just comment also on kind of a combination of both the Dr. Calkins and Dr. Sears's comments is that I, I think that it is vastly underappreciated the um, just overall in the medical community, the huge role that anxiety plays um, in these patients. Um, but also, as we've heard from everyone here who knows taking care of these patients, the huge role that PVCs um, can play in provoking that anxiety. So I appreciate that we're really thinking about the whole person when we're thinking about uh, measuring outcomes in these patients, because even though PVCs may be transient, we have years and years of data that there is a stable burden of PVCs in almost every affected ARVC patient. Um, and so whereas the amount may come and go, they may always be there. And so even something as simple as treating PVCs, you know, we really could think about that, um, you know, with appropriate measures, as Dr. Sears appropriately pointed out, we really need to figure out what the appropriate measures are, but with appropriate measures, you know, treating the PVCs on the medical side may be indeed a, a really important uh, holistic approach in terms of treating the overall impact of this condition in patients in their day-to-day -day functioning. Fantastic. Um, definitely something we will spend some more time talking about as well, but, um, you know, not maybe not surprised uh, having, you know, moderated uh, last month's meeting to hear you, you know, talk about that relationship between PVCs and, and anxiety and the kind of to total uh, person's health. Um, so I really appreciate you highlighting that. Um, and, and Mario, you as well, I'd like, uh, you know, any reflection that you have, um, anything that stood out from you or noteworthy from the ARVC patient voice um, from last month's meeting? I mean, it is, uh, first of all, very encouraging that uh, an animal model that we developed through a number of years and validated through a number of years has uh, been, um, has presented the potential of, of leading off to the possibility of therapy. Um, I think that the, the, the cautionary words are out there. Um, the um, selection of the patients, of course, will be a critical component. I just want to say that, uh, you know, in the, there is still some things that we can continue to contribute in the, in the discussion from the laboratory end. Uh, we are currently working on uh, exercise models uh, for the mice and trying to see if the therapy that we validated uh, on sedentary mice uh, will continue to hold if we put the mice on exercise, given that 
of course, that is a component of what the patients have referred to. Um, so hopefully we will get some data that, uh, you know, will shed some light onto whether the protection that we get with the, with the gene therapy in the animal model um, uh, continues, uh, even if you stress the heart a bit. The other one is that um, all the work that we have done has been with one particular gene, being it's placophilin 2. It is the most commonly affected, but uh, there are a number of patients with uh, other genes, and in particular with desmoplakin gene. And uh, the reason why there is no direct immediate extension into desmoplakin gene therapy is that the desmoplakin gene is too big to fit it inside the AAV. So uh, we are very interested in trying to understand what pieces of the desmoplakin gene are essential so that we can minimize it and then see if we could then uh, have, a, have a future line in there. And then the third one that is not something that we are actively doing, but I know that uh, is in everybody's mind and, and hopefully animal models will help uh, is on the risk stratification. And, uh, you know, which is the patient that will benefit? At what point will it benefit? So with the animal models, we can see, you know, how late into the progression of the disease can we enter with the gene and still have an effect. We were able now to push it to a time point in the cycle of the disease in the mice that would correspond to the young adult uh, in the human a point where the very early manifestations are present. But how late can we intervene and still have an effect is something that we, we want to know. And of course, colleagues that get a more holistic view of the genome are very much interested in, in uh, whether there is any information there that can be mined to uh, risk stratify the patients better. Sure. Um, so it is exciting times. Uh, of course, what we have done is in animal models, and I always use the quote uh, said by a, by a British statistician some decades ago, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, so of course our model is wrong. Uh, it's not a patient with ARVC, but hopefully we continue to find things that can be used as predictors uh, of advanced ideas that then can, can be implemented to the patients. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for uh, today kind of holding down on our panel the connection between, you know, what's going on with kind of our, our basic science and translational research into what really is important to patients and helping us connect the dots on, on maybe where the future of drug development is um, and, and how that anchors to what is important to this, this patient community. Um, so I want to take us into uh, you know our first topic, which is maybe the most obvious topic, as a number of you have already started to comment on this, which is really you know linking that externally led PFDD input to um, how we design clinical trials, and really specifically you know um, having outcome assessments that you know are measuring and capturing things that are meaningful to patients. Um, you know. I, we certainly heard from Larry's summary of that meeting that arrhythmias and PVCs, sudden cardiac ar uh, arrest and fatigue are some of those top rated symptoms. Um, so I guess my question really to this panel is, are we, you know, are we measuring the right symptoms in clinical trials? Are we capturing the right health effects? Um, and what opportunities maybe do we have, um, you know, if, if we need to, to better align uh, what we're measuring in clinical trials? Um, you know, I think Dr. Sears, Sam, you, you did a great job of, of starting to highlight some um, of those opportunities. So maybe we'll start with you, Hugh, on, on this question. Um, now that you, you, you mentioned you were interested to hear what, what Sam had to say, now that, that you've heard it, you know, uh, you know, where do you think we are in terms of whether or not we're measuring the right things? Um, you know, where do you think are some opportunities there? Well, I mean, as an electrophysiologist, I'm obviously interested in arrhythmias. And as Brittany pointed out, PVCs are not only the, a, a very, very common cause of symptoms, anxiety, they're also you know, the PVC burden is directly related to arrhythmia risk, the chance of having a sustained VT or VF, VF episode in the next 
period of time. We have a study where we looked at that. So certainly any trial on ARVC should be looking at PVCs, I would think is one of the primary endpoints. It's easy to measure. We've done research showing that it's quite reproducible day to day. We have simple tools like uh, patch EKG monitors like we used in Wojciech's uh, Fleck and I trial. So clearly that needs to be one of the endpoints. And of course, other endpoints, sustained VT, cardiac arrest needs to be another endpoint. But the problem is those episodes occur infrequently. So from a rare disease study design perspective, it's hard to show statistically you have a reduction in VT events unless you had a very, very large study, which would be hard both to do financially and also patient recruitment. You know, another obviously important parameter that needs to be measured is quality of life. And, and this is where I need to turn it over to Sam. From my perspective, there's many, many, many quality of life tools out there that measure different things. And you have to, when you design a study, you can't give them 100 pages to complete with 10 different quality of life tools. You got to be, you, you know, um, you got to be careful not to overburden the patient with too many of these scores and questionnaires. So the question becomes, if you're going to ask a series of 10 or 20 quality of life questions, which what's going to get you the most bang for the buck? And that's something that I'll turn back over to Sam to tell me what the 10 questions are, or does, is it his? I think he has a, a, a scoring system that I think has been well thought out, but that's something that's beyond my focus, which is more on simple things like PPCs. Yeah. Well, thank you. And Sam, since you were called out by your fellow uh, panelist here, I'll, I'll uh, send it to you next. Um, yeah, so you, you gave us a great landscape of different opportunities you know, maybe as, as uh, I'll put a, some words in Hugh's mouth, you know, kind of help us pick, um, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, that there might be value of, you know, uh, quality of life is almost too vague or, or not the right term to capture, you know, all of the different measures we might be talking about. You know, I thought some of the things that you mentioned on, um, you know, uh, actually capturing function in everyday life um, and everyday tasks, as being, you know, really important. You also no noted, um, you know, kind of a, a, a pet <laughs> clinical outcome approach of mine, which is, uh, you know, most bothersome symptom, um, you know, but I also know that there's a number of actual PROs that, that you know, you were um, describing and alluding to. So, um, you know, if you kind of had to, to priorita prioritize your, your dream, you know, kind of set of, of broader um, measures that go beyond just the arrhythmi arrhythmias and PVCs and the start sudden cardiac arrest, what might that look like? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I, you know, I do think that PVCs, I, I would come up with something like this, that there's a symptom burden of which PVCs and other kinds of arrhythmic events occurs. So the physical burden, a mental burden. So to what extent does uh, this disease and any treatments alleviate or add to mental burden. So physical burden, mental burden, daily burden, and then I think future burden. So that kind of four parts, I think it would be a to, to way to stay as parsimonious as possible, but comprehensive. And I like the idea of, see, this is why we're, we're all buddies on this, on this panel, because we all are looking at ways of, of, of swirling together things like arrhythmia counts, things like patient reported outcomes, like we all recognize, we all have very small pieces of the puzzle that we're all trying to put together in various ways, everybody on the panel. And so I just like the idea of, of, of a physical burden that, that is consistent with electrophysiology, a mental burden, which is consistent with psychology, perhaps, and then a daily burden, which is consistent with patient experience, and then life long term, you know, how people see the future. The future is an essential building block of the present. What we think about to, tomorrow matters today. And uh, that's why hope is so important for everybody. I mean, whether it be Mario working on this, uh, trying to build the perfect mouse model, or, or <laughs> you trying to, you know, have this institute running for 25 plus years, we have hope, and hope helps us in the present. So I think. That's what I would do, those four parts, physical burden, mental burden, daily burden, and future burden. That's how I would do it and try to reflect that. And then we'd get patient input about, about 
what does that mean? So daily burden might include fear of exertion, for example. Um, but we could, so there is a, there are, there, there's a paradigm out there, but it, it hasn't been settled on. Sure. Well, uh, Wojciech, I'd like to, to, you know, as now we're having this opportunity to dream up our, our ideal, um, you know, set of, of endpoints and outcome assessments in a, in a trial, um, what, what does yours look like? I think that I agree, obviously, with prior comments on PVC burden or arrhythmia burden. Using those patches and other ECG devices, we can do it pretty well, not only for one day, but for several days, which is more representative for given subject. But um, uh, since number of our ARVC patients are with ICDs, ICDs very elegant monitoring tool. And we continuously have ability to uh, detect arrhythmia and evaluate whether somebody had aggravation of arrhythmia due to this or the other therapy versus reduction in arrhythmia. We always fear, uh, based on history of antiarrhythmic medication development, that some medication could eventually cause uh, proarrhythmia, meaning increase arrhythmia. And when we conducted this flaconite study, which we presented at Heart Rhythm Society meeting in May and will be submitting to publication soon, we uh, on purpose had patients with ICDs and all, and we were able to evaluate not only PVCs on seven day Xiopatch, but we also had ability to look at some arrhythmias which were recorded um, uh, by ICDs. And ICDs these days do not require patient going to physician office for a checkup. This interrogation, as we know, is done remotely. So patient even don't know that they, their device is interrogated and the data is collected. This is what we did in our study with Flecanide. So this would be important uh, to collect uh, this information, especially at early stage of given therapy, uh, where we are worried about safety at the same time have additional ability to collect data. I would also uh, like to have comment from some. Obviously, we uh, know that some is world expert in the field of quality of life and psycho psychology of patients with cardiac diseases and I ICDs. Uh, the question could be asked uh, some whether apart from typical series of questionnaires which, which could measure anxiety or other uh, traits, uh, whether like in heart failure patients, obviously not all ARVC patients present with heart failure, but in, like in heart failure patients, data on their activity, daily activity, wearable type of devices might probably complement uh, questionnaires. Because as we know, in regular heart failure patients with other diseases, and this includes, of course, ARVC heart failure patients, the daily uh, activity will reflect their actual quality of life and maybe sometimes more objectively than some questionnaires which might be less um, less informative in this case or maybe parallel so so many comments on on those technologies well, let me before let me jump in uh, Wojciech, i think your points well taken and implantable defibrillators these days they measure activity they can measure pvcs and so that you, you would think would be a very simple, elegant way to determine how much activity or people no. do, how many PVCs they're having. And then the sad reality is the complexity comes from there's three or four different manufacturers with different programs and different settings and different interpretations. So it becomes a real nightmare trying to use this data clinically. But I think that's certainly something that we need to be moving towards. I think that's, I think you, we need to do a lot better job taking advantage of the information that is can be provided from these devices. And, and I think that's a good encouragement to all of us in the field to pay more attention to that. 
and I, I would agree uh, that we the accelerometer available in defibrillators gives us a reading. I think the more we move toward uh, 3D accelerometers that give us more like steps, where at least people kind of understand what a step is. It turns out it's a little bit scientifically squishy, but I think we understand that you know moving about's good. Um, in the air, every seed population, we have some limitations there that we want to think about, but all of that goes together. And I think uh, the point of Dr. Zariba's comments is that we need to look at objective measures of quality of life as well. Things like working, things like being able to have recreation the way you want, being able to do household chores, uh, doesn't sound like quality of life to me, but, but you know, the idea of being able to do stuff like that, uh, carry your groceries, those are examples of, of, of behavioral markers of quality of life as opposed to simply self-report markers. And I think that's why Dr. Zariva is exactly spot on with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mario, if you want to add. Yeah, something. I would like to uh, ask a question and make a comment as well. Um, obviously, the particularly for the first patients uh, undergoing this uh, uh, gene therapy, um, it will be very stressful. Uh, the protocol is not just go get an injection and go home is a very elaborate uh, protocol involving multiple days, multiple testing. Um, Sam, would you recommend to the companies that are going to be sponsoring these initial trials to provide not only the medical support, but the psychological support to the patients that are willing to uh, go under the first rounds? Absolutely. Because psychological support in this situation is not like everyone's sad and anxious, let's fix them. It's much more relationship-based. Relationship it's simply being respectful of another person's adversities and simply being human. Um, yeah, it takes some clinical skill, but, but we also, these, these persons willing to step forward for science for these reasons, they need support. All of us need to want to support them. So I, I think that's a just a human, humane way of thinking about it. So, so rather than think of it as, oh, we're here to fix distress. No, we're here to walk in your walk alongside with you, walk in your shoes in a way. Um, and I think everybody on this call, we we all take care of patients. We know intuitively how difficult this disease is, and so I think that that's just good care. So I think that's an issue for all of the care across the American healthcare system. I think that's what uh, Brittany was saying, yeah. um, but but in this trial will be even more important. Everybody's on the same team. Yeah. Sam, let me push you a little bit further. You, you know, think of patient number one, the first patient in the world to roll yeah. up the sleeves and get gene therapy delivered for ARVC. Yes. You would think when you talk about uncertainty and stress and whatever, can you comment on that patient number one, what in their head in terms of psychological support or psychological positioning or equanimitas or what what is the right set of, of, of the right position to be in to help get through that this is exciting but a little bit spooky next step in ARVC treatment yeah this is a very serious matter from a placebo nocebo effect right so when you introduce an unknown an unknown therapy with unknown consequences. And I don't mean the disease, but I mean, I don't know what side effects might occur. That when you leave human beings who are smart and perceptive, to looking for something that might be changing, they find it. Meaning they find side effects. That's why we have something called a placebo controlled trial. Having said that, this won't be possible in this case. So the, 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 let me just cut to the chase. When you look at some of the COVID data, uh, vaccination data, it is better for us to tell people at some level, here's the range of symptoms you might experience um, as opposed to leaving it as a blank check of symptoms. Uh, I temper those comments. There's some problems with that data, but, but the bottom line is that when we ask people, how are you doing? That's not going to make sense. We're probably going to need them to look more like a pharmaceutical trial where you'd have, do you have any neurologic symptoms? Do you have any psychiatric symptoms? Do you have any um, dermatologic symptoms. Do you have any blah blah? And and target that because being when you are when human beings are aware, if someone's watching them, their behavior changes, uh, and th that's a well known effect. Yeah. Well, so very sophisticated question. 
Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, I do want to circle to Brittany here. You made some really profound comments you know, at the start of our session here, um, you know, about kind of the inner relationship between, you know, uh, you know, arrhythmias and PVCs and and anxiety and um, the possibility of improvement in one having, you know, going into that feedback loop that Larry described that we heard from the patients, um, you know, maybe being able to help with that anxiety. I guess, of course, the, the same broad question of, you know, uh, what opportunities are there to, you know, measure some of these things that are important to patients. But I'd, you know, also like your, your personal reflection on, um, you know, what of those things fit into that anxiety feedback loop that, that you've seen with, with the patients that you work with, um, you know, and, and, you know, how can we help with them with what was clearly, you know, one of those top priorities. But at the end of the day, you know, anxi anxiety maybe is a little distal of a, of a symptom, you know, too, you know, too far, too many things impact anxiety um, to be able to have that be kind of the primary thing we're looking at. So yeah, we'd love your reflections on, on endpoints and, and of course anything related to that anxiety feedback loop. Right. Yeah. I love so much that we're talking about this because um, as we all know, taking care of these patients, um, this is really one of the biggest challenges we face just because of all the different aspects of this condition, both being uh, all the points that Dr. Sears pointed out, genetic guilt, familial worry, um, you know, exactly as you said, anxiety is going to be about a lot of things, you know, and, you know, reducing PVC burden alone may not be enough to fix that. Um, I think, and I'd love, you know, to, to maybe push Sam a little bit and potentially get his comment after as well about, um, you know, I think psychological support may be even too vague of a term, kind of like, you know, you have IT support or psychological support, I think, you know, potentially we could require as part of this trial that you have ongoing psychological treatment, you know, that this is part of your treatment. Um, or potentially, you know, we know um, Dr. Sears and Dr. Calkins and I have studied this in our patients that many of our patients have extremely high pre-existing levels of anxiety and depression. So what sort of pre-screen um, uh, or baseline data are we requiring? And is there a point where it becomes an exclusion criteria slash, you know, requirement for, you know, ongoing treatment, things like that? I think we just need to think carefully about those things before, before we go and measure it on the outcome. Um, but to get to your question, James, I think, you know, exactly as you said, anxiety is multifaceted. Um, and, you know, there are measures out there that you can look at measuring it in many ways, both just device specific anxiety, but fear, hypervigilance, avoidance, um, you know, attention to symptoms, all those sorts of things, um, uh, as well as, you know, kind of some broader things. There are tools in, in my field in genetics about the concept of empowerment. Um, empowerment is a holistic comp um, component thinking about in genetic conditions, specifically about hope for the future and ability um, to um, handle your disease as, as much. So um, there are some constructs we can look at there. In addition to, um, you know, while we're measuring those things, we can look at just the day-to-day -day life of these individuals as well of, hey, are they getting up off the couch more because they're not as hypervigilant or not as scared as their steps increasing? Um, are they able to, you know, reduce their amount of days where they're not working? How are they reporting on interaction with their family members? Um, all of these sorts of things, I think that we can measure um, in a non-survey based way specifically, if that gets at what you're hoping for, James. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, and before I have Sam, poor Sam, everybody's throwing throwing questions at Sam. Uh, but I'm going to throw one of those questions back at you, Brittany, because you thought it was important enough to raise, which is, you know, do we have to consider kind of baseline anxiety status as well as baseline kind of, you know, mental health care, you know, as an important factor in, you know, trial inclusion, exclusion? You know, can you tell us a little bit why you're raising that? You know, could you see that you know, if there were imbalances and that wasn't controlled leading to confounding, what does that look like um, from your, your perspective? I think Dr. 
Dr. Hawkins, you know, really approached it, uh, you know, correctly that he's like, this is really stressful, this entire process, and it's going to be stressful to roll up your sleeves and be the first one and go through this. Um, And I think it's not unlike a lot of the evaluation that they look at as part of the transplant um, uh, process of, hey, are you psychologically and um, familial and emotionally and live, you know, quality of life support ready to go through this process? Um, They do that as part of transplant workup routinely. So I think my personal opinion would be this is not unlike that, that you should have the support and be in a psychological place, either with treatment, um, support, all these sort of things to be able to handle this sort of novel. And, you know, I think we all agree a big deal. Uh, I think Dr. Calkins says spooky, um, but it's, you know, it's not a small undertaking. It's not a magic bullet. Um, I think patients should really understand what this is doing and what the potential impacts are that this is not waving a magic wand and you're back to where you were before you knew about this disease. So I think that uh, that should not be overlooked as part of trial design. If I I may, I think that an important component in this process is that as opposed to other diseases, uh, cancer being one example, where you can intervene when it is, uh, you know, your patient zero can be a very sick patient and then you are sort of trying to bring a last hope. Um, Here, our patient zero cannot be a terminal patient because what these uh, therapies can do is to arrest the progression of the disease. The damage to the heart is done. The virus uh, gene is not going to restore uh, cardiac cells. The cardiac cells that have died have died. So you are trying to find the sweet spot where you have a patient that has enough cardiac function that when you arrest the progression of the disease, you are actually providing a significant benefit to the patient. But it is also a disease that does not progress in a straight line. And therefore you are saying to a patient, you are okay now, you're in that sweet spot. We can put the gene back. it has its risks and it has the benefits, though I really don't know where are you going to be in 10 years. Um, so I think that that is part of the uh, part of the complexity. Uh, uh, and of course, my colleagues would know better, but, uh, but that I see in, in bringing this to the clinic, uh, particularly in the patient that is not really a terminal patient. It has a decent amount of heart function still, and yet is willing to arrest the progression of the disease by trying this new approach. Yeah. Well, thank well you. I think uh, uh, Brittany's point is is very well taken, and uh, Brittany spends a lot of time with each of her ARVC patients and, and really understands, I think, where they're coming from. And this notion of a, if you're getting a transplant, you get some psychological evaluation or whatever or family support is looked into. I think the same probably applies to a impactful treatment like gene therapy. That's, I think, a very good insight that I hadn't thought, thought about before. So, Brittany, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, I, I think it's a set of brilliant points, too, about the timing also that uh, Mario pointed out. I guess the only thing I can think of, transplant is the best parallel. I guess the other one I was thinking of was like being an astronaut. You know, who were the first people that decided to get into that capsule and go? They looked for the people that were as mentally strong and able to manage the problems as well as they could. I mean, there's limits. We can only know, we only know what we know. And, uh, and tolerance for unknowns is actually a, a characteristic that could be important. Tolerance for what we don't know. Can you tolerate that, right. that ambiguity? It really is a. It, it really is tough. If you any of us look at ourselves and think about how we tolerate what we don't know about ourselves or our world, it's uh, it's humbling. Absolutely. So I, I want to circle us back to a topic Brittany started us on, which is about inclusion exclusion criteria. You know, kind of moving moving beyond the the endpoints discussion, but to other aspects of clinical trial design. 
you know, I think we started a discussion about, um, you know, whether anxiety and, and care for, for mental health, um, you know, are, are important inclusion, exclusion criteria. Uh, Wojciech, maybe I, I'd love to hear your thoughts as a, you know, clinical researcher. You know, do you think that these are important things to consider at baseline? Are there other things um, that, you know, based off of what we heard from patients would, would be important to consider as well? I, I believe in category of patients like ARVC, psychological support, as some indicated, is of tremendous importance. And therefore, clinical trial, uh, especially if we speak about gene therapy, I like your parallel with astronaut, uh, is really uh, needed, I believe. And um, it, it should be followed regularly. And uh, I'm not sure right now whether the companies that push it uh, will have or have this component included. I know that they have some quality of life for sure, because it was discussed in the past, at least at one meeting with one company. But <clears throat> but uh, this uh, aspect of uh, quality of life, anxiety, and kind of like uh, pace in the potential um, uh, treatment mm -hmm. is really something which ultimately uh, patients will need to uh, take. You speak about uh, James inclusion exclusion criteria. Obviously, from clinical standpoint, not only psychological standpoint, one would need to brainstorm whether really for first attempts of novel therapy like gene therapy, mm -hmm. you really want to go to very uh, advanced patients who are really heart failure patients with totally damaged right ventricle. And do we really expect that this particular heart will regenerate in, let's say, three, six, or nine months? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. We don't know, simply. Uh, probably less sick patient, but maybe with good number of arrhythmias will be better uh, approach, not that damaged heart, still arrhythmogenic heart. Uh, this would be my thinking about qualifying patient for such early studies, having patients who are not really very advanced in heart failure, but advanced uh, from arrhythmia standpoint, and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, at early stage, we should have ICD on board mm -hmm. you know, for both safety and monitoring uh, purposes. And this goes along some recommendations that all these patients should be followed psychologically and monitored psych psychologically throughout the study. So I think what Wojciech brings out is, I think it's really important. One of the things we learned about this disease is the electrical manifestations come first and the heart failure manifestations are, are much later on. Mm -hmm. So that you know, the patient who is electrically unstable would be the, the sweet spot in terms of gene therapy before they develop cardiomyopathy, their EF goes way down. Mm -hmm. So I think this feature of the disease fits in well with, I think, our, our plans or the overall strategy. So I, 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 I think that's a good point. We did have a question come in from one of our viewers today that I would like to address to Sam. Um, it's from Justin, and he says, given the lack of patient-recorded outcome measures in patients at risk of malignant arrhythmias, is there any ongoing work to develop and validate a PRO in this population to facilitate monitoring of novel, novel therapies? Well, it's a great question. So, there, not not there is no measure being developed related to novel therapies. What would there be stand-in measures? Things like shock anxiety, things like ICD device acceptance, things like uh, specific disease beliefs. Um, that's going to be the closest we're going to have. So, when we when medicine moves forward, and it does, thankfully, when medical science moves forward patient reported outcome science has to run in behind it, but it's usually behind it. And that's, that'll be the case here. Um, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm 
frankly floored by both um, my colleagues' reactions as well as the um, patient reaction about the importance of psychological aspects here. I mean, I, you know, when you look at the meeting from before, it really was a lot about this this disease burden, and and so. Um, I think we've got to be innovative. I think my science has to be more innovative, frankly. The burden's on on my science. I think that's what he's asking of me, which is get going. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll get going. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the the exhortation. Yeah, well, thank you, Justin, for that question. Um, uh, so with some of the very limited time that we still have together, I do want to kind of um, go to an area, another area that we heard really loud and clear at the externally led PFDD meeting, which was we heard from a great deal of patients and caregivers of pediatric patients um, that they have a desire for treatment for those who are gene positive, but currently pre-symptomatic. Um, so maybe even uh, in a situation where um, they don't fit that that sweet spot, you know, Hugh, that you were just describing. Um, they're really, you know, in a, in a situation where they don't have, have symptom onset yet. Um, you know, given that there's such a great desire expressed by this community, um, I'd like to see any of our, our panels, panelists have any thoughts about, you know, what, what would a clinical trial for this population look like? You know, um, how could we facilitate drug development for, for you know, the pre-symptomatic people? Let me just start. I mean, uh, I mean, certainly that would be a beautiful world if we had gene therapy that was curative and you give it to kids you know, at age five when they get their genetic testing done and they can go to the Olympics and no ARVC. Beautiful world, and I hope that's where we get to. But obviously, before we do that, it really comes down to safety. We have to pursue, you know, make sure the drug is safe and effective before we start doing it in the pre-symptomatic phase. And if, Patients who have a genetic variant, we don't call them mutations anymore, right? Brittany, you call them genetic variant. Only about, we'll say, 30 to 50% develop manifest disease, and Brittany will correct me with a, with a real number. And that's highly dependent on exercise level and exercise dose, particularly with PKP2. Uh, so I think, you know, given that only one in three really will get the disease, you know, the, you darn well better be a very safe treatment before we can go there. But let me turn it over to Brittany. What what are the numbers about how many will get the disease who have a genetic variant? And what's your thought about doing this in kids? Right. Um, that all is, is totally true. Um, and I think the the one the one terminology you forget with the genetic variant is we have to make sure it's a pathogenic genetic variant. Um, and that is easier said than done, right? Uh, we have a lot of work to do in genetics on trying to understand um, how specific variants may or may not impact actually the function of that protein in the heart. Um, and there are many things that we are confident in the risk for um, and some things that our, our evidence is continuing to evolve. And so exactly as you said, you know, we spent the first 30 minutes of this session talking about risk benefits. Um, and unfortunately, right now, until we prove that this is safe and those individuals that are um, completely asymptomatic, the risk is just too great yet. We have to prove that it's really safe first because as Dr. Calkin said, we have um, a ton of data in placophyllin 2 carriers um, that, that penetrants, meaning the likelihood of getting disease if you have a pathogenic genetic variant, um, that may be as low as 30 to 50%. The problem is, is when I talk to asymptomatic gene carriers, we're not very good at predicting that. So who is that 30 to 50%? If we could predict who that 30 to 50% is, then that may really help things. Um, exercise is one important modifier, um, but the other thing that Dr. Hawkins also brought up is bringing that 30 to 50% number back to placophyllin 2 is it is also very gene specific. Um, we're getting new data on in the other genetic um, causes of ARVC, how that penetrance number may range. So uh, the data is a little bit out on that um, uh, and catching up. And so so I think we have more work to do there and we have more work 
to um, prove that this the benefits are worth the risk before we look to asymptomatic gene carriers. But yeah, that's what I tell every family, you know, when we're thinking about this, that that's the gold, you know, that's the holy grail of genetics is uh, gene therapy in young, unaffected individuals um, preventing disease manifestation. Um, so that's where I think we would hope that we get down the line, but there's a lot of steps before that. I would like to add one more comment on this topic. Um, just this week, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, there is publication from Dutch group, uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Colkins is collaborating with uh, extensively. Uh, they publish paper that is focused exactly on uh, so-called possible and borderline individual. Possible means that somebody is pretty much gene positive and asymptomatic and borderline are those which are gene positive, but at the same time, they have at least one criterion uh, for diagnosis, not like in case of uh, fully affected people who meet all 2010 that's first criteria, we speak about one criterion. So somebody has some PVCs or maybe some findings on, uh, on uh, imaging. The bottom line, what was interesting in this paper that the likelihood of developing disease in next three, if I remember right, years was seven or eight fold higher in people who had some symptom or some indication for disease apart from gene positivity. So when we speak about uh, identifying first patients who uh, should undergo this probably therapy, mm -hmm. uh, novel gene therapy, we probably should also consider those who didn't develop yet full-blown disease yeah. and may have only, as they say, one criterion uh, fulfilled, and those will be um, maybe rescue before in next three to five years they develop um, full-blown disease. So I like this article very much, and I believe this is a two kind of separate group which one could prioritize depending on the future of this gene therapy. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, we are. Uh, actually a little over the time that we had uh, to, for our discussion today, but I do think that this has been an incredible start to the discussion and helping to translate the ARVC patient voice into drug development and clinical trials. Um, you know, I know there'll be many more conversations uh, to come um, to build on, on where we started today. So I really wanna thank all of our, our panelists who have um, spent the last two hours with us um, at this point, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Michael Ackerman, who is the board president of the SADS Foundation, to provide some summary remarks. Um, Dr. Ackerman is a genetic cardiologist with the Mayo Clinic, um, and we've asked him to spend a few moments to reflect on some of the key takeaways that he, he heard from today's expert discussions. Um, I know this is probably a very difficult task, um, given how much ground we've covered, um, but I know we are in good hands uh, with, with Dr. Ackerman. So Dr. Ackerman, take it away. Great, thanks James. And uh, I have loved these 110 minutes that we've spent together and uh, I wrote notes. So you guys kept me very busy, um, but I will start with, I have three or four takeaways. First, thank you. Uh, and the thanksgiving goes to many involved in this. So we at the SADS Foundation, the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation, we are over 30 years old. And in thinking of the late uh, Dr. Michael Vincent, our president and founder of the SADS Foundation, originally we're home for just families with a genetic heart disease called Long QT Syndrome. And over the past 30 years, as we know, we have become the home for families with CPVT, for Brugada Syndrome, and more recently, ARVC families have found the SADS Foundation as your home. And so uh, thank you for doing this uh, to you, Genevieve and James. Thank you to 
Brittany, Sam, Hugh, Mario, Wojciech, uh, dear friends of mine and uh, their commitment and passion, I'm grateful for. And so thank you for them to join. And I also would be remiss if I didn't thank the sponsors. This is an incredibly exciting time. And for because of the sponsors, we were able to do this. And for our SADS families who have diseases called not ARVC, so many of the lessons from June, from the voices of the ARVC families, the lesions, the diseases, they cross cover and they cross pollinate and they're directly applicable uh, to each other. And so a lot of learning has happened. And the most important thank you are to the families, to those patients and families who had the courage and bravery to share uh, your experience. And I know full well, as Sam can attest to, that those families who are thriving, they probably weren't in that PPFD because they're too busy playing for the NBA despite their genetic heart condition. And so we may have some level of an ascertainment bias. It would be fascinating to figure out the 65% give or take who are thriving versus the 35% who are suffering and see what are those factors of resiliency that, that could help us boost that up under current therapy. But for those who took the time to say your voice, we've heard you loud and clear at SADS Foundation. Our mission statement, number two, is to live and thrive despite your heart condition, despite your ARVC, and despite your long QT. And I think it's safe to say the living part, if you define living as not dying suddenly, if we diagnose you and treat you, living is happening. But we've heard clearly over and over again, we're not thriving. And we're not thriving well enough and any cardiologist who think that we have these conditions solved, long QT, all you need is beta blocker, CPVT, maybe two drugs, ARVC, do your drugs, now do flaconide, add ablation, get a defibrillator, and you know if you need to, get transplanted, as if those are solutions, uh, those cardiologists uh, ought to retire because we're not there. And I think that's been loud and clear. In other words, the third uh, con conclusion I have from this experience and from the different conversation is the status quo is not acceptable. We have not arrived with effectively treated. We need new therapies. And that brings us to where we're at now is I'm inspired and aspired. As, as Hugh knows, I've been on staff at Mayo Clinic for 23 years now, Hugh longer, and uh, at Hopkins. And for the first 20 of those 23 years, we never, as in never, had the idea of a new disease specific therapy that might actually have an FDA approved indication for that disease happen in all of genetic cardiology, as in ever. And now the last three years, we do. Mavic Hampton for HCM, the first FDA approved drug for one of our genetic heart diseases called HCM. And now with our sponsors and where we are in discovery, we have in the last two, three years, gene therapy trials, not just be hyped as futuristic, but coming around the corner as in circa 2023. By end of this year, early 2024, patients with a variety of genetic heart diseases HCM will be receiving genetic gene therapy for MYBPC3 HCM. PKP2 ARVC families, which we discussed today, those first inpatient trials are going to happen in very near future. In other words, the future is here today. And I think this is an unbelievable time to be a genetic cardiologist. It's certainly a wonderful time if you had to be a family with one of these genetic heart conditions to be one of those families in this millennium rather than what we were stuck with just five years ago, 10 years ago. And so I think families should have a lot of hope, but what we finally need to be measured by, and I think we sort of talked about it towards the end, Hugh mentioned it, that first patient, uh, that selection, that support structure around that, 
is this new gene therapy era that we're in is not going to be a yellow brick road. Patients won't be receiving gene therapy as standard of care starting tomorrow, starting a year from now. These trials will take time. There will be setbacks. It's not going to be just a perfect, you know, ramp up to the, the, the voila moment. And so I think our communication is going to be critical to these families that slow and steady is going to win the race, that we better be methodical and careful. We better have support structures uh, provided. And I think for the families out there, the final comment would be the gene therapy companies are competing on the targets. Great. What they have chosen not to compete on is safety. The gene therapy companies, all of them, and I've spoken with all of them as Mario, you have as well, they are cross-sharing best practices in safety, safety of delivery, the immune treatment strategies to prevent unwanted reactions. So while one company may have the better target and advance that target, PKP2 for PKP2 families, all of the gene companies are sharing breath, best practices uh, in terms of making the delivery as safe as possible. And I think that should be an encouragement for all. So thank you, thank you. Live and thrive. We gotta start working on thriving, we're not there. Status quo is not acceptable. And now's the time for all of us to do this together. So Genevieve, James, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman, for those key takeaways. Today's conversation has been a powerful way to integrate the perspectives we heard from the June 20th SADS ELPFDD meeting into guidance for future ARVC research and therapeutic development. Today's program will be available for on-demand viewing right after we conclude at the same website you are on now. We couldn't have done this meeting without our expert clinician scientists Thank you to Dr. Michael Ackerman, Dr. Hugh Hawkins, Dr. Mario Delmar, Dr. Samuel Sears, Dr. Wojciech Zariba, and genetic counselor Brittany Murray. I would like to thank the FDA for allowing us to hold this adjunct scientific meeting to our ELP FDD. We're extremely grateful for everyone who participated on June 20th and joined us today. This meeting has provided an important opportunity to reflect on the tremendous input that our community provided to ensure that therapy development and clinical trials best support the needs of the ARVC community. Our expert clinician scientists provided valuable insights that acknowledged those needs. Thank you to Larry Bauer and James Valentine for your participation in today's meeting and guidance throughout the entire ELPFDD process. I'd like to take just a minute to summarize a few important points from today. The first one we heard about was the tremendous mental health burden the ARVC patients bear. This is caused by the diagnosis itself and the daily ambiguity they live with in regards to disease progression. Patients describe a vicious cycle of PVCs and arrhythmias tr triggering anxiety and anxiety triggering more PVCs and arrhythmias. The mental health burden is also caused by ICDs used to treat ARVC and the anxiety surrounding shocks, both appropriate and inappropriate. ARVC is a disease that affects the entire family and parents have tremendous concern for their children who have inherited an ARVC gene. Families, as we have heard, want a treatment that will prevent disease from developing in asymptomatic individuals and also treatments that help to progression of disease in those who already have manifestations of the disease. Today, our experts put forth valuable ideas that can help facilitate therapeutic development for ARVC and influence clinical trial design. It's imperative that we listen to and include patient reported outcomes and quality of life measures as we consider possible endpoints. The message that we heard loud and clear from our experts today and from patients with ARVC 
is that current therapies are not allowing ARVC patients to live their best lives. We must use what we learned today to change this and facilitate therapeutic development that is meaningful to these families. ARVC patients are hopeful and are looking forward with cautious optimism that they will see better treatments become available for themselves and their affected children. One last heartfelt thanks goes out to everyone who attended the ELPFDD and today's program. We look forward to moving closer to newer and better therapies for ARVC families.